Good afternoon again. For those of you just joining us, either on Facebook Live, where 20,000 people have already viewed today's program, um, my name is Kinshasha Holman Conwell, and I am the Deputy Director of the museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's final panel. And uh, have you enjoyed today so far? Yes? Wonderful, wonderful. And this panel is Monuments and Power, Memory versus History. And of course, this is the final panel of Mascots, Myths, Monuments, and Memory, uh, co-production of the National Museum of the American Indian and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Our next panel is going to be a discussion and it will be moderated by the museum's very own Paul Gardulo. Paul is a beloved colleague who has worked towards building the collections and exhibitions of this, the Smithsonian's 19th Museum. His research and interests relate to slavery in American cultural memory, public history, and the diaspora. And he is also um, the curator of the museum's exhibition, The Power of Place. Paul will introduce his panel and he will moderate the discussion which will be followed by a final question and answer period. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Gardulo. Good afternoon, everyone. I was gonna say we're all poor Gardulo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're multiple. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this afternoon. Uh, this is going to be a panel in conversation. We've had so much that has been put on the table today in terms of ideas, rich thought, uh, inspiration and provocation that we think it's best to sit down, talk amongst ourselves, and then open the floor to have an open discussion with you all. Um, let me first introduce our panel very briefly, and then we'll move into some conversations. Uh, to my right and, and your left is Tom Finkelpearl. Uh, Tom is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. He was important, appointed in 2014 by Mayor De, Bill de Blasio. He's the co-chair of New York City's Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art, Monuments, and Markers. That was announced in 2017 in September and then uh, just reported in January, is that right? So very new. Correct. Yes. Before that, Tom was the uh, director of the Queens Museum. Um, jumping over Aaron. Um, uh, Stephanie Rollins Blake was the former uh, 49th mayor, former mayor of Baltimore, uh, the largest independent city in America. And she instituted uh, the special commission to review Baltimore's Confederate monuments in 2015. Is that correct? Um, and she currently serves as a political contributor for ABC News and has her own consulting business. Um, and then Aaron Bryant, my colleague in the Office of Curatorial Affairs here is a museum curator for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, he served as chair of, uh, of Mayor Rawlings Blake's commission on Confederate monuments. And he's been the uh, curator of two incredibly important and provocative exhibitions here for the museum. Uh, one that is up currently called City of Hope at our gallery in the Museum of American History next door that commemorates and celebrates the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. Of course, at the far end of the panel, Lonnie Bunch, our founding director, needs no introduction. Um, <laughs> but I'll introduce him anyway. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> 
So we are here, I think, to talk a little bit about some of the same issues that came up in the last panel. Questions of memory, questions of power, questions of how institutions from museums to governments um, grapple with these questions, not from the perspective of activists or scholarship, but uh, administrators and practitioners, some of whom may be activists as well, uh, and certainly are scholars. So let me begin with a, with a brief list of just place names that I've heard today. Austin, Boston, Gainesville, Charlottesville, Baltimore, Brooklyn. That might be revealing my East Coast bias. Julian presented these other international city names from Cape Town to Oxford um, to New Zealand. Um, what is it about this present moment that these cities have become these flashpoints? Is there something important about this moment in time. And I think I'd like to ask uh, our colleagues to have a general discussion, but I'd like to, ask, like to ask Lonnie to sort of put this moment in context. Think about, is there something that's, that is in the 21st century that's driving these questions currently about memory, about race, about the legacies of slavery and colonialism? I think it's crucial to recognize that what these are really about are about national, regional, and, and local identity. And as cities, as places are beginning to redefine themselves in the 21st century, they begin to ask fundamental questions about their history. And they begin to realize that it's a false dichotomy to say the past versus the present, that the past and the present are so linked. Um, and that we are still wrestling with all of those issues. And I think part of it is that there's been, obviously, incidents that have caused people to focus their attention around monuments, around symbolism. I also think it's crucially important to understand that race continues to be such an amazing moment, an amazing issue for Americans to grapple with, that as we begin to look at race through the lens of place, suddenly you're asking yourself these questions. What do these monuments mean? What do these statues mean? And I think what's really interesting to me is that these monuments really are, as we said earlier, that they're as much about today as they are about yesterday, and that in some ways what you see is people grappling with a revision, a revision that says, yes, the South lost the war, but won the peace. What does that mean now? And so I think all of that undergirds a lot of what you see going on today. So as um, administrators, as people who founded commissions within two major American cities, I wonder if Stephanie and Tom, you'd talk a little bit about that process. What was the genesis of the commission? What were the main goals of each of the commissions? What were, what were the real, the, the main challenge? And then what were the beginnings of the, um, the results of those? First, thank you so much for inviting me to be here, to be a part of this uh, incredible panel, but also this, I think, very meaningful and timely discussion. Um, Baltimore, and I think you have the East Coast bias because that's where all the, the, the <laughs> most of the monuments are because that's where, you know, that's where we started and that's um, where um, a lot of our founding history, um, or most of it, is, is, um, is located in, I don't know, Baltimore is, is a city that we, among our many names, one of the, them is the city of monuments because we have so many. Um, and uh, as a place that is so rich with history, uh, when the issue of the Confederate monuments came up, I knew that we had to make sure that we got it right. Um, you, you mentioned this time um, that we're experiencing, not just in this country, but I think globally, um, and having these challenging conversations and experiences around race and, and place, and I think it's, it is coupled with a, um, a response time uh, expectation that has um, dramatically uh, shrunken. Right. 
so before, I think people did not expect uh, within 10 minutes for a city to respond on Twitter or Facebook or something else uh, when something comes up. And now, and now, 10 minutes can seem too long, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think that exacer exacerbates this moment uh, and makes it much more volatile. Uh, and I knew uh, that the Confederate, the Confederate monuments in Baltimore were, it was a volatile issue. And for me, I, I think um, being raised by a, a mathematician and a, and a physician helped me be a lot more logical and le less dependent on emotional responses for things. And I think, I think it was helpful because I knew that we couldn't just have a knee-jerk reaction. We needed to put a thoughtful uh, process together. And we, uh, I put together a panel of um, members of our Commission on Historic and Architectural Preservation, as well as individuals who were, were responsible for the city's public art. And I wanted them to be thoughtful and deliberate about you know, why those monuments were there, um, how have they been experienced in the city since they've been there, and what do we want um, our, the representations to, to do and to say moving forward. And I was very, very pleased. Aaron was fantastic as the, the, the chair and um, really took a, um, a thoughtful, intellectual, um, but comprehensive uh, look at uh, how we should uh, move forward with the monuments, and I was grateful for that uh, because there were a lot of emotions that were running high, and sometimes when, when I've seen, we talk about the response times, just recently in a lot of monuments, you know, people were just snatching them down, um, and I said, and, and that, that's great for that news cycle, but then what? Mm -hmm. What happens after that? What are the lessons? What are we, you know, what are we doing with them? Is there, should there be conversations about them? And if you're not thoughtful about it, you know, who knows what happens um, moving so, forward. And, and you had mentioned the emotions were running high. I think that for, for everyone in the audience, the reminder here is that, um, and correct me on the timeline if I'm wrong, but you, you initiated the, the commission in Baltimore in the wake of Freddie Gray's murder or death rather, and, and, and during his trial, is that, is that right? And so it's, it's suddenly the past is collapsing into the present, uh, and it's not just about uh, statuary. And it looks like Aaron wanted to jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna, uh, going to add, not only were we holding hearings and looking at these Confederate monuments with the community at the same time that they were holding trials for Freddie Gray, and in some cases, directly across the street and outside our window. There were Black Lives protests happening. Uh, but also, we were responding in many ways to the shooting in South Carolina when we first began the commission. And that goes back to the mayor's point about um, having a response to something because immediately people are looking at these monuments and asking questions and demanding answers. So on top of what was happening in South Carolina and protests around South Carolina and the Confederate flag, we had the Freddie Gray case. And so, um, obviously, the commission is responding to public need. The commission, as you said, is divided in between, not divided politically, but divided into sort of specialties. Uh, it sounds like there's the art and architectural uh, camp on the one hand and the historians on the other. And did, can, Aaron, how does that break down in terms of their thought, their attitudes uh, toward the past and toward these objects? Uh, well, it was, um, yeah, there were seven of us on the commission. Uh, I was the chair, so I'm the guy sitting in the, in the middle and I'm pretty much supposed to remain neutral. Uh, to my left, we had all of the folks representing uh, public art in Baltimore's public art. And to the right of all of the hearings, we had the folks representing uh, the Commission of Historical and Architectural Preservation, which I'm um, also a commissioner uh, for history, uh, historical and architectural preservation. But I was a museum curator uh, in art um, uh, years ago. And so I was literally in the middle, ideologically as well, <laughs> as, well as physically. And the historians, 
really just wanted to take the monuments down in many ways. They were like, just take the stuff down because it's not accurate in terms of how it represents uh, Civil War history and the history of the Confederacy. It, it represents more the lost cause, a, a, a 20th century kind of phenomena or a late 19th century phenomena. To my, to my left, however, with the um, art commissioners, uh, they wanted to keep all the monuments up because they represented important examples of, of art, particularly with the Robert E. Lee uh, Stonewall Wall Jackson monument. That's a double equestrian. And for people uh, who work in the arts, you, you know, a double equestrian is an incredibly difficult um, sculpture to make because essentially you have these two horses and the way that it's shaped, all of the weight is at the top and you have these really skinny legs. So it's like having a huge, heavy tables sit on toothpicks. Uh, so the engineering involved in something like that is really special. So we wanted to save that um, as art historians, but the other side of that is, but it's not really accurate history. Are these similar kind of questions yeah. and debates that are going on in New York City in your commission? It sounds very, very similar. So I was asked by the mayor, um, the mayor, the other mayor, de Blasio, to uh, co-chair commission. Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation was the co-chair. We had 19 people. We had art historians, um, historians, artists. We had MacArthur winners, Pulitzer Prize winners. Really incredible group of people. Amazing discussions. Um, crazy, lengthy hearings that lasted sometimes four or five hours long. The debates in the commission were like the debates that were happening in the city. And there was a kind of counterbalance between like the art historical questions versus the historical questions, questions of race and representation. What does it mean if something had good or bad intent when it was put up versus what does it look like now to an average person walking by it in New York City? So, but it, it wasn't Confederate monuments and our commission wasn't intended to answer the question about particular monuments, although we did, the commission did make uh, recommendations on four monuments. It was meant to create uh, a process in the future to deal with, you know, a universal process right. to say what are the what becomes a controversy that becomes considered. How do you do the historical analysis, et cetera? Um, but the same thing. I would uh, echo what. Should, can I call you Stephanie or Absolutely. the mayor? Absolutely. Okay. What Stephanie was saying was the news cycle is so crazily fast. None of this stuff is new. I mean, the controversies around monuments. Are, have been going on for decades and decades in New York, and I'm sure it's the same in Baltimore. But the answers had to be immediate. So even for the mayor of New York City to say, we're gonna give you 90 days, which turned into, I don't know, 120 days by the end, <laughs> um, to think about this seemed like a luxurious, lengthy, in-depth consideration. Um, so it sounds very, very uh, familiar to me, the kind of issues you guys are talking about. In some ways, it's so interesting that I want to add just a little different wrinkle. We've been talking almost all day when it comes to Confederate monuments about monuments of white men. But there are also Confederate monuments that are about the loyal Negro. And so it adds a different level of complexity. I mean, for example, this museum is a great now monument on the mall. But I don't know if you realize that there was a great fight in the early, in the 1920s because the Daughters of the Confederacy wanted to create a major monument um, honoring black mammies on the National Mall. And that, it, and that Congress supported it, but it was the NAACP and several other progressive organizations that actually fought against it and eliminated that monument on the Mall. That was really in reaction to the response that, that the Lincoln Memorial was getting. The Lincoln Memorial raised issues of equity and race um, in the minds of many, and so the Daughters of the Confederacy wanted to create an alternative to that. What's so fascinating is if you look around the country, there are many loyal Negro statues. If you go to Harper's Ferry, there is the um, Hayward Shepherd statue. Hayward Shepherd was a free black porter who was at Harper's Ferry when John Brown's raid occurred, and he was actually killed accidentally by John Brown's folks, well, in the 1930s, the Daughters of the Confederacy said, we've got to counter this notion of aggressive black people demanding rights. What we need to do is remind people that there were African Americans who suffered 
um, in this struggle that ended up being the Civil War. And so they created this wonderful statue talking about how loyal certain Negroes have been and how that their loyalty to the South should not be forgotten. So there are literally probably 15 or 20 of these that are still extant that are also part of this discussion. So I just wanted to make sure that we recognize that it gets a little more complicated because now it is it's explicitly about race and trying to create a sense that how do you counter what was considered an aggressive push for civil rights? Um, the best way to do it is to hearken back to the loyal Negro, the loyal retainer. I think that's so important, Lonnie, and I think that you know this it it, it comes back to your statement that at the top of the day, where you're like, these, these monuments were built in a period of time, right, in a moment in time, primarily the 1890s to the 1930s, 40s. Um, it echoes exactly the timeline of our, first, our morning's first panel, where it was the same time in which mascots, these racialized mascots were being developed. At the same time, all of this plantation mythology is being developed. And so it's, it's important for us to kind of unlock that moment in time a little bit. And from the perspective of monuments, right, it's writing it right onto the landscape, to the landscape of segregation. And so I think that's why it's so powerful, Stephanie, when you say, like, you know, these are, these are happening in the states of the former Confederacy, but these monuments are happening all across, right, the U.S. And um, Aaron, you were, you were mentioning to me the, the practice of redlining and how, it, and how it may tie in with that historical phenomenon. I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, yeah, if you look at the period of time, uh, reconstruction and moving through Jim Crow and segregation, of course, that's when we have a lot of these monuments being built in cities uh, across the country and different kinds of monuments, not just one speaking specifically to African-American uh, segregation or uh, subordination. Uh, so reconstruction, Jim Crow, segregation, you know, these monuments become a way of um, marking a territory and uh, creating an image in people's minds about hierarchies. Uh, in Baltimore, for example, the, I think it's the double equestrian um, I was just talking about. It was actually constructed by a woman, which is another reason why it's important. Uh, it was a double equestrian, and there are few in the country, maybe even the world. Um, that's important because it's created in 1948 at the time that we're getting into these ideas of, of uh, redlining and segregating neighborhoods. And so you have these monuments showing up in neighborhoods in Baltimore to make it very clear to people that we live here and the people who live in this neighborhood believe in these things and you stay over there. Uh, the Taney Monument, for example, um, in, in, um, uh, in, in Baltimore, Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon area, was actually commissioned by, uh, I think it's Benjamin Walter, who's you know the Walters Art Museum, uh, in Baltimore, he commissioned two of these sculptures as a way to remind people you're not welcome in this neighborhood. And so, you know, it's all a part of a history of reconstruction, of making sure that we remind people of certain kinds of hierarchy, whether they're racial or socioeconomic or, or whatever. I just wanted to, t when uh, Aaron brought up the Taney Museum, it reminded me of the, the same challenge that to talk about the, the fact that these conversations have been going on, uh, or controversies have been going on for decades, um, the one on the mall in, an, in our state capital in Annapolis, and there was a, a big controversy about taking this down uh, back in the 90s, and at that time, my uh, father was in the legislature, uh, and he was the chair of the Appropriations Committee, and the reason why that we have an amazing amazing monument to Thurgood Marshall is because of the Taney Museum, I mean Taney Monument, right. because instead of uh, taking it down, which is one of the reasons why I think that it's important to keep having these conversations and they have to be ongoing, he said instead of, you know, we can take it down, that doesn't erase the history, we can put up an additional uh, monument and it, they're right across the mall from each other, which I think tells a really important story about our state. Right. Be so, go ahead, Tom. Tom. I was just going to say that, that basic philosophy was the result of our commission. So our commission said, we are taking one down, <clears throat> but 
in New York City, the idea is we got $10 million. We're going to commission new works of art to add, take an additive approach, and to fill in the gaps. Ford Foundation is throwing in some several hundred thousand dollars to do the research, uh, to figure out what has been left out of the narratives, women, people of color, you know, that aren't on the pedestals, that aren't being uh, memorialized. And then that's, anyway, so that idea, the additive approach, for better or for worse, was the result of our commission. I just want to say that. Is it always an additive approach, Lonnie? Is it always about adding more stories? Is it sometimes about something more complex than that? Well, I kind of like the notion of pruning, um, that periodically you just got to prune, and that I do not ever want to see all these monuments taken down, because they're too important in terms of historical lessons, um, but I also think that if you can prune, that means you can add other stories. But also, I think the big challenge is to figure out how do you contextualize monuments? You know, we know what we want to say. We, want, we know what these monuments mean. Is it enough to put a label or a plaque next to it? Do you do what they did in Budapest, which is take all the Soviet era statues and put them in a park? Um, on the one hand, you would say, well, does that elevate them? But on the other hand, what it does is that entire park then becomes a way to interpret what these statues, what they once were, what they meant to people who lived through the time they were erected, and what does it mean now that they're no longer in their original spot? So the challenge, it seems to me, is to think about what are the ways you really can add not just new stories, but you can add new stories to old, on, old monuments. And that's something we're really wrestling with. One, one of the most fascinating conversations, we get a lot of incredible visitors to the museum. Just a few weeks ago, we had uh, descendants from the Tawny family and descendants from the Dred Scott family. Um, and I, does, does everybody, when we reference Tawny, does everybody here in the room know what we're talking about? Judge Tawny is the architect of the Dred Scott decision, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And, um, and, and could you just summarize the decision? The decision, uh, the decision that resulted in, uh, um, Tani wrote a decision that basically said, the Constitution enshrined that black people were less than human. They could never be citizens of the United States. Dred Scott had appealed through the court system for his citizenship. This was in, uh, this was in the years following the Fugitive Slave Act uh, of the 1850s. Um, and so we had a visit from- He actually from quantified Go ahead. How, how much less of a human we uh, African Americans were. It was three fifths. Right, and that written into our Constitution. But what was fascinating was this proposal by the descendants of these families to take the, the statue that was uh, taken down from the State House and to create an installation that juxtaposed Tawny with Dred Scott. And this is another, you know, these kind of, these. Um, creative, thoughtful methods toward how can we deal with the past? How can we juxtapose historical figures, whether they be Thurgood Marshall or Dred Scott himself becomes a fascinating, I don't think just like intellectual exercise, but I wonder if your commission, Tom, or, or the one that you worked on, make room for things like that and uh, inspire and encourage things like that. Uh, that actually was one of our recommendations. I, um, I became interested in being a curator after seeing uh, Mining the Museum at the Maryland Historical Society, seeing Mining the Museum, where Fred Wilson goes into the collections at the Maryland Historical Society, and he juxtaposes objects against one another to create a new way of interpreting these objects. So he has a whipping post, for example, and he sets, uh, he installs the whipping post, but in front of the whipping post, which is shaped like a cross, he has these very refined decorative chairs to make a commentary on people sitting and watching this happen to human beings. And so that informs some of the ideas we came up with with the commission. How do we do something similar? Or the fifth plant in the UK, um, where you have artists coming in and it's a rotating exhibition around this space, uh, public space in the UK. Um, making commentary of, of some of the other monuments that are in the space. So I, th I think, for example, it's important for museums to also think about collecting 
some of these monuments. Um, I think we'll probably do that um, because I think, you know, let's say you collect a monument from Baltimore, let's say. Um, think about, as an object, what that can tell us. That can tell us the story of Freddie Gray. It can tell us the story of sort of the notion of race in an era of Donald Trump. It could tell us stories about the Confederacy, about urbanization. So I really think that these monuments are just unbelievable sources of real interesting information. And I think it's incumbent upon museums to also think about, yes, they're large, they're huge, where are you gonna start? But I could imagine collecting that so that let's say 15 years from now, a curator wants to talk about today. I, don't, I can't think of a better artifact than a monument, a Civil War memorial. By the way, that's fascinating because I've heard many museum directors saying, that's the third rail, I don't want it. Ah, so that's yeah. really great Come to hear you say that. Come sit by me. Yeah, 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 that's beautiful. Um, so I just want to give one example. In New York City, there's a notorious gynecologist named J. Marion Sims who experimented upon enslaved black women in the South. And it was, you know, there's a lot of literature about that, about the inhumanity of that. So his sculpture was put directly across the, from the Academy of Medicine, one of the great, you know, and he was a member of the Academy of Medicine in New York City. It's a, you know, 175-year-old organization. They wanted it gone. The community board wanted that sculpture gone. The Museum of the City of New York, which is also right there, wanted it gone. So he, that sculpture will be removed and placed in a cemetery, which is, by the way, where he's buried. But on then, so then you have the empty plinth. So what do you do with that? So the recommendation of the commission is to find not, so there are three women, three enslaved women who are named by name in the literature about J. Marion Sims. So one of the ideas was to put up a memorial to them. An alternative uh, thought, which is, was what was recommended by the commission, is what about finding three African-American doctor, women doctors who made contributions to medicine and say, the contributions to medicine across from the Academy of Medicine should be the uh, positive model, uh, not the, so it's a very complicated question. Like, are you going to recognize the savagery of what he did? And the idea is to do that, but through labels, and do labels ever work is a very good question. But to put up three or four, you know, something that, that an artist comes up with, images that are positive. Thank you. Again, it is because we're having uh, this type of discussion that I think really creative things can come out and things that will speak to our culture for years to come because I can understand why um, commissioners would recommend having the patients uh, there as a constant reminder of medical ethics. Uh, because in, in Baltimore, uh, we face our own challenges when it comes to medical ethics. Um, the movie Henrietta Lacks um, tells that story. And it's a story that if you grew up in Baltimore, um, a lot of people uh, had what I thought growing up was um, an unnatural, um, I, don't, I don't, hate is a, is a bad word, but um, distrust, yeah, of, of hospitals, local yeah. hospitals. And then, you know, the, the stories, you hear the rumors, these stories that, oh, you know, this hospital's experimenting on black people. Experiment. And then you see the, the, the real history. And I think to tell that, to tell that story in, um, in monument, uh, represent, monumental representation of the, the patients who for years um, were seen as less than and not worthy of uh, you know, the, the same uh, rights that every other uh, human should have, which is not to be experimented on, and, and the, the medical ethics didn't apply uh, to them. So I think that's a it's, it's very important conversation to have. Right. And that, I mean, that is, those are some of the conversations that are at the heart of our conversations in building the museum, when to inspire, when to uh, tell very hard truths, um, and when to uh, really talk about the resilience of people, or always to talk about the resilience of people. And I think one of the fascinating things that has come out of today's discussion is, you know, un unfortunately, the resilience of racism, right? And the incredible ways in which it, it remounts, refigures, re kind of uh, reforms itself in new contexts over time. And 
I was struck by, um, you know, positively uh, by Bree's comments in the last panel, Bree Newsom's, where she's where where several of the commentators were talking about: Does changing the representation really matter? Is it enough? Does it go far enough? Um, for your constituents, for the people in New York, for the people in Baltimore, when we think about um, when we think about this, is it what role does representation have? What role do these kinds of changes mean, and do they go far enough? Yeah, um, I would just add one of one of the things that I noticed when we held hearings in Baltimore is that people really wanted to be heard. They wanted to have some sort of avenue for discussion. So you talk about these discussions are not just important for policymakers or people who are sitting on commissions. They're really important for the community. And that's one of the reasons why it was important for me to uh, be on this commission and to chair the commission. I was amazed at how many people came into the room and sat and listened to one another. Um, I'll never forget there was this one Hispanic uh, gentleman. He was actually Mexican. Uh, I forget his name. Um, but he had a full Mexican name, and he was a son of the Confederacy. Uh, he had a white mother, uh, and he was raised by his white grandparents. And so when he got up and told his story, the whole room got really quiet because people were listening to try to figure out where was he coming from, like what perspective was he coming from. And so they had to listen. That's important. They had to listen because they wanted to understand. And all of a sudden, it changed the dynamic of that space because people were finally listening to understand as opposed to listening to argue. And that night, we had a number of people representing the Confederacy and white supremacist groups who actually came up to our commission and said, thank you for listening. That's all we wanted. And we got it on the other side as well, where people said, we just wanted to listen and get our thoughts heard. To be able to connect to humanities, I think that's really an important process for whether you're in New York or Louisiana or Baltimore. People just want to be heard. Any <clears throat> thoughts on that? Um, so I talked to some folks down in New Orleans. You know, as we were doing this, we were talking to other cities. And they said, you know, this is a truth and reconciliation process. And reconciliation is all fine and good, but not if you haven't gotten to the truth. That there has to be that, you know, account taken. And so, it, you know, I do think that monuments are important. They wouldn't be, you know, I mean, they've been like huge demonstrations and it's been a broiling situation for a long period of time. But if, you know, just taking down a monument or, or having a meeting, and we had lengthy and sometimes moving, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> public meetings with hundreds of people showing up, but, you know, the truth question, I think, is the fundamental underlying question. And so we're going to try to, you know, work with the Department of Education of New York City and, and work monuments into new curricula. We had a very robust representation of the Department of Education on our commission. And so, you know, this is a big chore. We have 1.1 million students in our system to get that kind of education. There's this idea of the teachable monument, like the teachable moment, right? How can you learn from monuments? But I think it's a long process. It's not going to happen overnight. But I do, you know, I mean, <clears throat> getting the discussion started is very good, and it's very good to have a robust conversation. Go ahead, please. And I think having the commission lends itself to having that truth and reconciliation. When you just rip it down, um, what happens after that? And I mentioned that in my opening, uh, because we have to figure out ways to have really tough conversations in our in our country. And I haven't seen that when we when we have those knee jerk reactions that the meaningful conversations end up not uh, happening in communities where they need to have them the most. So, in other words, reconciliation is is not just a moment. Reconciliation is a process. Reconciliation has different definitions for different groups. But I want to we'll come back to this kind of question that Aaron had, which is, is it really about everybody's voice at the table? Is it about everybody just wanting to be heard? See, I guess I'm, I got a, just a little bit of a different spin on this, is that I do believe that representation, making these changes incrementally as they are, are fundamental to truth and reconciliation. Um, I think about the civil rights movement. If you look at the civil rights movement, not every sit-in was transformative. Not every march changed the world. 
but the cumulative effect of that um, changed the country in a way people would have never expected. Um, I'm a big believer in this museum, we really try to find tension, is the word we use, tension between resiliency um, and victimization, optimism and tragedy. So it was important for us to listen to a lot of different points of view, but it was also important for us to try through our own eyes to find the truth. And that ultimately that meant that there were certain points of view that we just, we listened to, but they weren't gonna get up on the walls of this museum. Um, and I think that that's our job, in part, to make some of the hard decisions. In some ways, I don't want to bend over so far backwards to be fair that we forget to be truthful. Right. Um, fairness is great, but fairness alone has often led to people who should have power not having that power. Um, so for me, it's about what, through our lens, do we think is right? What's the good fight we want to fight? I don't want to do any work if, it's not, if it doesn't have the potential to be transformative. Um, and so I think that the challenge is to really wrestle with if we began to grapple with these monuments as teachable monuments and other things, what's the end game? How far are we going to push this? What do we really want to try to accomplish? Because I really do think this is, a, this is an important moment and I want to make sure we don't miss it. I think in not missing it means you have to trust the, the process and open yourself, open yourself up to a solution that you might not uh, even consider when you start the process. I didn't know what the commission was going to do, but in, in my mind, if I put smart people together, smart, thoughtful people who had the capacity to listen, that I thought we could something positive could come out of it. But when I think about, um, before we came out, I started thinking about all the different ways um, monuments can be used in an ongoing way um, to, re, to, to reinterpret history, to speak about um, what we idealize or prioritize or value in our uh, society moving forward. Um, those monuments can be a way to have those conversations or representations um, moving forward. And, and I don't know how to do that in the, in the way that um, protects the truth. Um, but I know that, that's a po that I see that as uh, a potential, really powerful way that um, artists can um, inter interact with the community, that members of the community can, can um, mm -hmm. participate as well, but we have to open ourselves up to um, how these monuments can be used, and again, without having the answers up front. If I could just say thank you for mentioning the word artist. Uh, as Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, I want to thank you for that. Um, but I would just want to reference the Vietnam Veterans Memorial here in Washington, D.C. So that's a memorial that doesn't tell you what to think about the Vietnam War. It tells you that we're honoring 59,000 people who are named by name, one by one. <clears throat> one, by one. It's a very moving place to go. And I think it, you know, that was a transformative moment in the history of monuments in the United States. And that if we had monuments that were as intelligent and complex and, as that about these you know, uh, issues in the past, it would be a different situation right now. The problem is that we said, we're putting somebody on a pedestal. As soon as they're on a pedestal, it's like, that's not the right person. There's almost nobody that really deserves to be on a pedestal, quite frankly. If you go back, even the quote, good people, back in the day, you know, they were probably anti-Semitic, probably racist. You know, once you start digging into the surface, that pedestal is, is a lie almost all the time. <clears throat> but the Vietnam better this kind of truth in it, right? It's factually true. Every American service person. Now, there's millions of Vietnamese people that died that aren't there. But I just want to, I want to throw that out. And it was an artist who came up with that brilliant right. idea. But it was My still own. unbelievably controversial. It was. Right? I mean, you talk to veterans to this day, and I have veterans tell me it's one of the most moving things, but can we also remember the veterans that survived? And that's why they put that, right. that, those and, three statues and near. And the nurses. You know, and the that, Frederick Hart right, addition yeah, to the Maya right, Lynn right, Memorial. Right, right. So which, I, by the way, I think is a pretty good compromise also. Right? There's a, yeah, it is, you're right. But, super in a, but, in a, but, I, but I love the note, but it tells you the possibility of what these monuments can do. Um, you know, I'm not 
the biggest fan of monuments per se, but I think the best monument that I ever see is a monument in Savannah, Georgia, um, in front of an African-American church that is a monument to Haitian soldiers who fought in the American Revolution. It is brilliant. It suddenly changes everything you think about the American Revolution and about the Battle of Savannah. Um, it honors all of these people who you never know anything about and who are left out of the narrative. And that convinces me that additive does work. Because um, for a while I wasn't sure it did. But, so I'd love to be able to continue to see that balance. Well, it, of yeah, a little pruning I'm, and a little adding. I mean, I think it does. It sounds like there is always a balance. There's never one right answer. The, the, the importance and profound implications of the, of the Vietnam Vets Memorial here erases, as you said, the millions of Vietnamese who died, right? As a, and as some might argue, uh, as, an, as, you know, an act, certainly an act of warfare, possibly an act of neo-imperialism, and sort of getting into the themes that were at the heart of the last panel. And so this question of community comes up for me, which is when we're thinking about these communities, uh, the, the people we're trying to memorialize, the incidents we're trying to sort of remember, how wide does that community get? Do we, are we thinking about, uh, and, and that example that you provided really provides a, a narrow but expansive version, vision of the American Revolution, Haitian people, mm -hmm. and the history and the historic connection that had been forgotten, mm -hmm. not to mention race. That, that's really powerful. But I think it, it's very tough. It's but, tough but to it, get expansive and unique but at the same the time. they made about having a commission, you know, having people, a process that allows these things to be grappled with. Because as we said earlier, so many of these Confederate monuments were really because of the amazing fundraising success of the Daughters of the Confederacy. I mean, I think in some ways that's an amazing story of what these women were able to do. They were able to take, a, take soldiers' dreams and make them into myths that became so powerful that they were able to raise money and became this juggernaut of myths and falsehoods. Um, but I think it's an amazing story. I think the question I always want to ask is, as you, you put together commissions, but how do you handle the politics of this, right? I mean, this is really, they're always going to be, you know, the folks strongly believe that you're doing something wrong. And I'm just curious, was there conversations about the political aspects of this and how to manage that? Um, or, or were you as pure as you could be? Well, first of all, I say, as a former museum director, I understand what you're saying about the fundraising success. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is what we think about all the time. Um, Look, what, what, it's interesting, what happened with the commission in New York City was put together largely by the Department of Cultural Affairs, the mayor's office, and back and forth, the mayor had an absolute uh, final say. It was a mayoral commission on monuments and markers. Um, what we, we put it together over a relatively short period of time. There was considerations. We wanted it to be very diverse, as diverse as New York City. It was men and women. There was, it was gay and straight. It was, you know, Latinx and African-American and Asian and you know, so there was a lot of stuff going on and then you know We wanted university professors and artists and you know all this stuff um, It ended up being sort of almost surprisingly a, a mirror image of the city in terms of politics in terms of opinions There was a vigorous debate on different sides of issues um, I mean look New York City is a very progressive city the mayor won 70% of the vote. It's not like some other cities are the country that's very split right now. <clears throat> but uh, I, I think it, that because um, we're putting together on the basis, not of politics, I mean, that's easy to say, but on the basis of expertise and diversity and all these other things, it ended up sort of just magically being a mirror image of the city. I mean, I want to get back to this, this question of economics and how things get actually created. I, we hear a lot, of, we're, we're talking a lot about how the commissions get created and work, but how does actually, how do the things become realized, right? And how are, how are complex democratic uh, processes then put into being um, through, through real funding? Through, you know, I mean, we heard about the juggernaut of the daughters of the American Confederacy. 
right, and the way they were able to galvanize their very tightly knit racist community to produce a lot. Well, you're talking about something that is uh, profoundly more democratic, uh, profoundly more truthful, um, but is it as easy to fund? I mean, I guess I asked that to the panel. Yeah, um, I, w I will say that I was um, followed up with a working group. Um, I work with these folks after this commission, and we came up with some recommendations for the current mayor of Baltimore City. You gotta put this up close. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so working with this working group to come up with um, other ideas related to the monuments, and, um, and I was appointed to that working group through the current mayor's office, and uh, we were looking at ways of connecting artists to these spaces, and through that, depending on the artist in particular, depending on how you write the proposal, there are opportunities for funding certain kinds of programs. Uh, it can be more difficult or easy, but I think the whole idea of bringing communities together around art and conversation, um, as I talked about before, certain cities were still are, need the healing, that becomes an easier sell um, in many ways. I would just say in New York City, the history of what monuments are up there absolutely recognizes who has had money, right? So if you had the money to bring to the city, it didn't necessarily mean it would be um, accepted, but those were the groups that had the money that got their heroes put on those horses, on those pedestals. So what we wanted to do uh, was to put money towards it that was you know, public money. So most of the monuments put up in New York City are not, have not been put up with public money, they've been put up with private money, like you're saying with these Confederate monuments. That's something we want to change, like the Harriet Tubman Memorial, which is a big sculpture up in Harlem, uh, was put up with public money. Uh, we have a bunch, we have a Roberto Clemente monument we're working on now, uh, Tito Puente. Um, there's a bunch of stuff going on with public money and that's a curative to the concentrations of uh, wealth in particular communities. I wanted to jump back to the, the uh, issue of politics, and I think in order for uh, the politics to be at bay, I think it's a matter of what, um, what politicians are willing to do uh, if they're willing to make themselves vulnerable for things that they believe are, are right, um, as well as what the community um, expects or accepts, um, because when the, when the community accepts a knee-jerk reaction to take something down uh, without any um, other conversation, you know, and it doesn't have to be a commission, but it has to be, in, in order to get the truth and reconciliation, it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because there is a process. Um, so when that happens um, and the community accepts um, that, you know, that mayor did something, she took it down, and, and that was enough. Um, you know, I think that makes it, it difficult to have those uh, conversations that need to happen, and I think that's a political decision. Right. Um, so, um, you know, the, the politics will always be in there, and it's just a matter of how you decide to play those politics and, and whether or not you're willing to, to stand up for the things that you um, believe uh, are right. And with respect to the funding, I know that we, we put in place um, uh, in uh, Baltimore, uh, we fund our public uh, art through a lot of our infrastructure projects. So that's uh, one of the ways that we ha are working to get uh, more representation of um, modern, um, or current uh, artists uh, represented throughout the city. Yeah, is it percent for art program? That kind of thing, yeah. Same with us, but we actually put some other money on top, but some of these are gonna go through that percent for art. The Harriet Tubman was a percent for art project up in Harlem. Ani, what were the, the challenges or success stories here in terms of trying to think through these issues, in terms of fundraising, which wasn't, all the fundraising wasn't public. A great deal of it was private, and how do you convince a, a normally conservative corporate sort of community to get behind ideas that they might not normally. I mean, I think that the fundraising for this museum was really part of a bigger strategy, right? And part of the strategy was to say that this would be a place that would dig deeply into African-American history, but it would use it as a lens to understand what it meant to be an American. 
So in essence, to suggest that this is both a community story and a broader nation, national story. And that really made it easier to work with many of the corporate community. It was specific enough that they could sort of sell it, but gen general enough so that, you know, they didn't know how deep the water they were about to jump in. Um, <laughs> and so that was really crucial. And the same thing with Congress, because even though Congress on paper was going to pay 50% of the cost of the building, there was no mechanism for that to happen. So it really was being political building your allies, figuring out what you ask, what year, who are the people that are gonna help you get this done. And candidly, in our case, it was first and foremost making sure first the Bush administration, then the Obama administration supported what we did. Because as you know, in the federal budget, it's the president that puts the money in and then it's easier to defend it as it goes through Congress rather than get Congress to add new money. So I think for us, it was the right vision and then we had something that very few people had. We had the best brand name in the country. So we said, how often do you get to build a national museum that's part of the Smithsonian that grapples with issues that divide us, that can maybe help us find reconciliation and healing? So all of that was part of the package, the way we sold the museum. So can then I just what say, I'm sorry, as a former yeah, museum director, what a magnificent job you guys did oh, here. Thank you. And can we just, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll never do no, this I mean, again. The, I'm done. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what my, my follow-up to that is, okay, so, so what is the role of this institution that ha that's, that's done this job in helping to help make politicians make vulnerable choices that help smaller organizations who are who might struggle in the ways that we don't um, to realize some of the same sure. things that we've tried to do. I mean, let me be real clear. This is an activist museum, all right? That's really been part of what we've done. And by activism, we mean that our job is to make a country better, not greater, better. Um, and, Okay, I'll get the call from the White House tomorrow. Um, but I think the point here is that when I look at National Museum of American Indian, I look at the wonderful work that they're doing, it says to me that you've got an opportunity to do something that isn't just about yesterday, but is about today and tomorrow. And so that's been an explicit part of what the museum has tried to do, whether it is you know, collecting Black Lives Matter or doing programs like this, um, the key is, um, as historians always say, we offer context, but maybe even more importantly, if we're doing our job right, what we're doing is offering the public tools to help grapple with the things that divide us, to understand the world they're living in. So yes, as I remember a colleague once said to me, it's hard enough to build a museum, now why do we have to make America better? But it seems to me that's what the Smithsonian ought to be doing. It ought to be doing always the hardest work, not the easiest work. And with that, I'd like to ask just our, each of us to kind of speak about that, that role of doing hard work. You know, Stephanie, you mentioned it, the only elected official here on our stage, you know, the, the importance of being vulnerable and what that means. And I think it's an interesting choice of words because when you're talking about that, you're talking about a strength, right? And so I, I would, I'd like you to talk a little bit more of that in the context of this conversation, what it means to be, and what is the necessary vulnerability. Yeah. And what and did you a, risk? Maybe. You know, what, did you, what, what kind of risk did you feel you were doing by doing this? So when I talk about um, being vulnerable, um, I talk from the experience of what was taught to me. Um, my, uh, as I mentioned, my dad was an elected official and he showed me what it means to hold your own community accountable. Uh, and, and he paid dearly uh, for that, whether it was uh, holding his, uh, his alma, ma alma mater um, responsible for uh, the funding that they were getting from the state, which caused a huge 
uh, controversy uh, when he, um, sh he shined a light on the misuse of the state funds and it was, it was, a, it was a mess. But he said that that was, you know, that, that he demanded excellence from himself and from his institutions. And the fact that he was a graduate didn't mean he was going to sweep it under the rug. Same thing with um, what um, my father did when it comes to public school education. At a time where he didn't have one child in the Baltimore City school system, he fought for a partnership that drove funding to the school system that, that has brought it to a place where my daughter graduated from the, a public middle school. Um, and I don't know of a, the, the last time a mayor had their children in public school. Now, my child was not a guinea pig. She received an excellent education, and that was a legacy of that work. But it means that you have to be okay with not being popular um, and, and not necessarily being expedient, because sometimes it takes time and it takes work, uh, and you have to be willing. Um, you, you talked about uh, fighting to find the truth. It's not always pretty. And uh, what does that mean? So I was, that's how I was raised. So I, you know, whether it was the work that I did uh, to uh, course correct our budget, uh, because we had huge structural budget deficits and it, they were allowed to exist for expediency because people didn't want to have the hard conversations about uh, the fact that our, our, the pension system wasn't going to be there for fire and police because of decisions that were made for political expediency. But I knew uh, that during my time as mayor, I wasn't going to sweep those things under the rug or kick the can down the road um, because I could not live with myself as a person who believed, I, I still believe I'm a, a servant of the people just in different ways, but I said I couldn't do that, that I was here for a reason, um, that I was here to make those tough decisions whether they were popular or not, but I wasn't going to leave the city in a worse condition than when I found it. And I strove to, I strove to do that, um, but you have to be willing um, to take some hits mm -hmm. and, and, and be okay with that and uh, to be able to look yourself in the mirror and say that you know that um, whether you know, your poll numbers are up or down, um, you're right. Aaron, I guess you know, I'm thinking about the, the role of a curator. That's what I do. I think about how you, you talked about the, the role of these, these monuments at a certain point in time, re-inscribing very literally uh, segregation, which inscribed poverty. Right, you just curated an exhibition on the Poor People's Campaign, a movement that explicitly linked right race and economics. What are the risks that, that a curator needs to take to in the context of this history um, to sort of to to make movement? Uh, I, I think it's a combination of both what Lonnie and Stephanie uh, said. You know, when you have to think of yourself as an activist in terms of not being passive about what happens to your community or what happens to your nation. Um, you have to be actively involved in, in being a part of whatever the process is. And so curatorially, I'm always thinking that way, like as an activist scholar, how do I use this platform to awaken people's consciousness about something that they can change or they can embrace or they should know about. And so everything I do curatorially is driven by that, the sense of activism and, uh, and waking, awakening consciousness. Uh, and then the other thing is integrity, going back to what Stephanie said. Uh, you know, I try to leave ego at home um, and be driven by the idea of integrity. It may not be the most popular, I may take a lot of hits, but it's necessary. Somebody needs to say this, somebody needs to create a platform for us to have these discussions, and I'm willing to take that hit and I'm willing to do that. So I think it's a combination of awakening your own consciousness through this process of discovery as a curator and sharing that with people, but then also doing it with integrity where it's not about you, but it's the greater good. But I would sort of almost argue that the other piece that really allows that to happen is scholarship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you've got to be completely immersed in the scholarship, be a good scholar. So I would argue that you can't take in public places like this, you can't be an activist if the scholarship isn't sound. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's why we always look there first mm -hmm. before we go anywhere else.
Tom, I'm going to get a little less personal here. You said you, got, you guys made four recommendations yep. for changes. Sorry, I should know better. Okay, um, okay. yeah. And what, what are the main, th looking forward, yep. what do you predict is going to happen? What's going to be the big challenges to what's coming next for, for you all in New well, York? Well, I mean, I think the biggest challenge, so we said in the, look, in New York City, you got Marcus Garvey Park, Frederick Douglass Circle, you got Malcolm X Boulevard, you got Harriet Tubman, you know. Where is the big memorial to Native Americans in New York City? Yeah, there isn't one, right? This is a big question. This is one of the biggest underlying questions of this commission. So I've been talking to folks to try to get that started. And that has to be a central uh, outcome of this. It was in the commission report. Um, but when, what is the memorial? And what is the nature? Who gets to decide? You know, so, Christopher Columbus, which is a big controversy, never made it to North America. His encounter was at Taino. The Lakota are the people that lived in New York City. A lot of Native Americans uh, who live in New York City are from Mexico, right? And, and I have friends from Corona, Queens, where I used to work, who grew up speaking Native American languages in Mexico or South America, like Mextec or Quichua. And, and it, what's their role <clears throat> in terms of and some, by the way, some of them are, quote, undocumented. I mean, these are Native Americans who were here thousands of years before any of our, well, I've known, I can't speak for the rest of the audience, before my family was here. And they're considered undocumented, but they're Native American. So what is a Native American monument? How do Native American, how do you get together the group of Native Americans to make the decision? It should not be made by me, obviously. Um, this is the, our biggest challenge, I think, going forward. It should be big, it should be public, <clears throat> and it has to recognize the folks that were here for thousands of years before other folks showed up. And, but it is going to be controversial. The Washington Monument here took, what, 85 years to build. It was a controversy on top of a controversy on top of a mm -hmm. controversy. We've got to get started because that has to be recognized. We're ready to have the debate. 